Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for, 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 for being here. This is indeed a, a marathon, exhausting day. And uh, I'll, I'll do my best not to just sort of fall over on stage, and I'm sure you guys will do your best to stay awake back there. Uh, this uh, might, uh, one of the good things about being last is I can go on a little bit longer. I, I've got an hour, but you know, I think maybe two or three hours might do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to keep it, uh, to keep it tight. Um, I've been uh, involved in these, uh, these uh, mysteries um, for more than 20 years. The talk I'm going to give tonight uh, will range across material that is in all three of these books. Um, and uh, so if you want further information on them, that's the place to look. Unfortunately, none of my books are available here, uh, but they can be, uh, can be obtained, of course. This is our beautiful garden of a planet, as, uh, as we are uh, familiar with it today. It hasn't always looked the way it looks today. Uh, if you go back to the uh, last ice age, which reached its maximum about 21,000 years ago, not so long ago, really, just the blink of an eye, uh, you'll find that uh, ice caps that are uh, two miles deep uh, sit on top of North America uh, and also uh, on top of Northern Europe. Now, uh, all the water that's frozen into ice in those ice caps had to come from somewhere, and where it came from was the world's oceans. Uh, so as a result, during the Ice Age, uh, the levels of the, the world ocean were 400 feet lower than they are today. All that water had come out of the ocean, it had been frozen into those giant ice caps, and when they melted, it went back into the ocean and sea level rose. So there's our familiar uh, map of the world with its, uh, with its familiar contours. But if you go back to the last glacial maximum 21,000 odd years ago, uh, the world really does look quite different. Uh, for example, there was no uh, Red Sea. Uh, it was all dry land, N nor was there any Arabian Gulf. It was all dry land as well. Uh, Australia was a much vaster continent than it is today. And, and Southeast Asia, uh, now an archipelago of, of islands and the Malaysian Peninsula, uh, was at that time a, a giant uh, continent-sized uh, landmass. Uh, all of the coastlines of the world were extended much further than they are today. Uh, and altogether, uh, 27 million square kilometers, that's about 10 million square miles of land, uh, went under the ocean when the sea levels rose. That's roughly the equivalent of the size of Europe and China uh, added together. Now, although the meltdown uh, did take place over 10,000 years, um, there were, within it, uh, three or four major, major episodes of flooding, uh, when uh, you could, in, in some cases, get as much as a, a 30-foot rise in sea level uh, pretty much overnight. Now, you have to consider what a 30-foot overnight rise in sea level would do to our civilization today uh, if it were to happen. Uh, I'm sure we've, we've all seen the, the horrific and troubling uh, images of the tsunami uh, in Japan. Uh, and we can see the, the catastrophe that is unleashed by nature just by uh, a, a temporary rise in sea level. So we have to imagine something like that, but on a global scale and uh, permanent. Uh, and consider what it did uh, to our ancestors uh, and, and uh, what effects it may have, have had upon them. I don't believe it's an accident that there are more than 2,000 flood myths uh, pretty much all around the world. Memories of a gigantic global flood that almost wiped out uh, mankind. Most uh, archaeologists and historians are not very impressed with flood myths, and they take the view that these were little local events, perhaps a river flooded its banks, uh, little local events which were then 
elaborated out by our superstitious ancestors who imagined it was a global flood. But I, I find that a completely unnecessary explanation since we know that there was gigantic global flooding during the 10,000 years at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, and it seems to me highly probable that the world's legacy of flood myths are a memory uh, of what happened at the end of the Ice Age. Um, and therefore it's interesting, I think, to look at what happened in the Arabian Gulf, the region from which the Epic of Gilgamesh comes, to look at what happened in the Arabian Gulf uh, at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, this, of course, is the, the Gulf today. Uh, and this is how it looked uh, during the last Ice Age. That is not an inlet of the sea there. Uh, that is a large river system combining the streams of the Tigris and the Euphrates, which had a series of very fertile lakes running along its length, uh, all of which uh, was flooded in one gigantic incident uh, approximately uh, 12,000 years ago. So I'm not at all surprised that a powerful memory uh, of a cataclysmic flood is preserved in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Same is true with the uh, Aborigines uh, of uh, Australia. Uh, we can see Australia today and Australia as it looked during the last ice age, clearly a huge amount of land has been swallowed up by the sea and uh, Aborigine myths uh, remember this time and speak of a great flood serpent that ate up the land. As I say, I'm not surprised that we have these myths. Uh, I do believe we are a species with amnesia and the myths are part of our memory, uh, of uh, a huge part of our story that we've lost, but they're not the only part. There's much more controversial material. Um, and that uh, controversial material, some of it, is contained in ancient maps. And uh, these maps suggest a level of uh, technology and uh, science that, uh, that was far beyond uh, the period uh, in which they were derived. Um, and, and before I go in more detail into the maps, I want to make clear that very often what we're looking at here are maps that were copied in the 15th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries from earlier source maps. And those earlier source maps have now been lost to us. We have the latest copies of them. Uh, and often those copies were adulterated by the copyists based on what they were learning about the world during the era of exploration. Sometimes they would impose what they thought was new knowledge on the old map and mix things up a little bit. Now, if you go back to the Dark Ages, 7th century and so on, um, this represents the, the standard of uh, map making technology at, at that time. These are called TO maps uh, because of the T shape in the middle and the O shape around the outside. They're, they're actually quite uh, beautiful maps, but you would never uh, wish to use them for navigation uh, because they're completely useless uh, for that purpose, although very nice for hanging on the wall. So these are the TO maps, and that was the standard of maps that uh, uh, were being used 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th century. But then during the Crusades, Something, something happened. Uh, uh, it, it seems that a whole archive of other maps were, were released into general circulation and began to be copied. And at the same time, the maps of uh, Claudius Ptolemy, um, who taught at the library of Alexandria, which had been preserved in monasteries, were rediscovered and became uh, the basis for the Ptolemaic uh, cartographic uh, tradition reawakened in the year uh, 1295. The other category of maps uh, that appeared at that time are the so-called Portaland maps. Uh, and these Portaland maps are a real mystery. They are um, really incredibly accurate in terms of uh, not only latitude, which, which really any culture can figure out, but longitude as well, which our civilization didn't crack the problem of longitude until the end of the 18th century. That's why before that, ships were constantly sailing into coastlines unexpectedly because they didn't know how far east or west of a particular point they were. 
But these maps, which began to enter circulation in the 1300s, probably from Constantinople, which in turn had probably received them from the Library of Alexandria, uh, contain incredibly accurate latitudes and longitudes, spot on accurate, as accurate as today's map. So it's quite difficult to see on this, on this uh, ancient map, but, but this is Italy here. We're looking at the Mediterranean. Very often you find that these maps do focus on the Mediterranean because that was an area of great interest to mariners at that time. Uh, but it's clear that they were uh, copies uh, of, they, they were fragments of much larger world maps. And um, Charles Hapgood, whose work I'd like to pay tribute to here, and his fantastic book, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, uh, traces the uh, Portolan ca uh, cartographic tradition through a predecessor of Ptolemy's. Um, and uh, through uh, the Library of Alexandria into Constantinople, released during the Crusades, and then out to European mariners. Um, as I mentioned, the, the source maps were often world maps, and, and one of them uh, is this map, the famous uh, Piri Reis map. Uh, the bit that survived of this map is only the bit that shows the east coast of South America and the west coast of uh, Africa was originally a world map, the other bits are lost. And in, hand, in his own handwriting on the map, uh, the map maker Admiral Piri Reis, who was a Turkish admiral, uh, tells us that he had based his map on more than 100 older maps, uh, none of which uh, have come down to us. Now, of course, the Piri Reis map is a very uh, controversial uh, map, but, but what is striking about it is the way that the continent of South America uh, seems to join on to a landmass at its tip. Uh, and this landmass, I would suggest, is Antarctica, as it looked during the last ice age, uh, when it was much more extensive than it is today. Now, this is Antarctica as we know it on our modern maps. And this is Antarctica uh, as it was known on maps at the beginning of the 19th century. As you can see, it isn't there. Uh, and it isn't there because our civilization didn't discover Antarctica until the year 1818. So naturally, if you drew a map in 1805, it would not have Antarctica on it. But the really puzzling thing is that maps much older than this one do have Antarctica on them. And these are the maps that are copied from older source maps, often by quite, quite well-known map makers like Arontius Phineas, here with his extensive continent of Antarctica, joining on to South America, uh, and also the, the, the great Mercator with his giant Antarctic continent joining on to South America. It's larger than Antarctica today, uh, but in broad outline, the shape, is, uh, the shape is correct. And we have to ask ourselves, how did Mercator and Orontius Phineas know that? Uh, and the answer is they copied it from older maps. Uh, you can go into many details on these maps. For example, a Ptolemaic uh, map from 1513 shows a little island lying off the west coast of Ireland. And this island is labeled uh, High Brazil. Um, and I know of a couple of expeditions that were sent out from Bristol, which is quite near where I live in Bath in the UK, uh, to look for High Brazil. Uh, but they couldn't find it. Uh, not in 1513 or in 1613 or today. Uh, what you actually need to find that island is a time machine. And we can do that with uh, geological studies of sea level rise, which show us that approximately, until approximately 12,000 years ago, uh, an island of exactly the right size in exactly the right place uh, did indeed exist where it's shown to exist on that uh, Ptolemaic map. Uh, the Waldsee Muller uh, map shows a vastly extended Southeast Asia. Um, and if we look at the details, I think it looks a whole lot more like this than it looks like Southeast Asia today or in 1507. Uh, and it's not confined to Western maps. This Chinese map of the Gulf of Korea is uh, carved on a stone stella in Xi'an. Uh, and here we see a much narrowed Gulf of Korea uh, with a little inlet marked at the top of it. Uh, and again, the latest geological evidence uh, indicates that such an inlet did exist um, 12,400 years ago, uh, before rising sea levels gave us the modern appearance of the Gulf of Korea.